announcements before we start. Uh, first of all, Michael Ehrman, our president, couldn't be here tonight, so I'm Helen Wilson, uh, vice president. Um, uh, the announcements are, um, if, if anyone here is interested in Squirrel Hill Jewish history, um, the Squirrel Hill Historical Society, in conjunction with um, the University of Pittsburgh and some other organizations, is working on the Squirrel Hill Project, and it's a year's worth of workshops, <coughs> lectures, um, um, there's a walking tour. So these, these flyers are on the table in the back of the room, and um, I went to the first speech, it was excellent, it was called When the Jews Met the Squirrels. <laughs> and it was, it talked about um, Squirrel Hill history and how the uh, Jewish people ended up here because up until about the 1920s, this was mainly um, um, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. So, okay, that was the first <coughs> announcement. And um, yeah, was there something else? Okay, um, anyway. Um, welcome all of you to the Squirrel Hill Historical Society. Um, I think it's very fitting to have this speech tonight because David Albert, our, our um, <coughs> presenter, is a veteran and this is Veterans Week. Um, and also I saw on Google the other day that some of the states want to secede. <laughs> so this is a very appropriate time to talk about the Civil War. And um, um, David Albert, our speaker, uh, he's a retired Air Force officer. Um, he has been a student of the Civil War for 40 years. Um, he's taken master, master's level courses and numerous non-credit courses and tours. He co-taught the Civil War elective at the United States Air Force's Air Command and Staff College. After he retired, he was a Civil War docent for 12 years at the Alabama Department of Archives and History. <clears throat> um, David Albert has taught a course on the life of the Civil War soldier for Elder Hostel, the University of North Carolina's Lifetime Learning Program, and most recently, both Pitt and CMU OSHA programs. Um, uh, most recently, he taught a course called the Gettysburg Campaign for Pitt OSHA, and will, he, he will be teaching that same course at CMU OSHA this, this winter. So tonight, though, um, most, most of you know that most of the Civil War was fought in the South, but um, Pittsburgh's role has largely been ignored, and David's going to tell us what was going on in Pittsburgh that was very important for the war effort. Without any further ado, David Albert. If you have any trouble hearing me, let me know and I'll use the mic. But I would prefer not to if I can, Is that if I right can help. Is that without it. the light? Uh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I think that I light? Need it. Yeah, I need it. <laughs> While this uh, title may, may seem redundant, I don't really feel that it is because the relationship between Pittsburgh and the Civil War was a symbiotic relationship where one impacted the other and vice versa. And I hope that by the end of this talk that you'll appreciate the difference that I perceive in the two titles of that. We'll see. If, uh, if not, then I won't have done my job very well. We'll start with, uh, I think there's a couple of seats over there. while no actual fighting took place in Pittsburgh during the Civil War, the war had a significant impact on Pittsburgh and Allegheny General, Allegheny County in general. Likewise, Pittsburgh and Pittsburghers played a significant role in the war, including actual fighting. What I'd like to do over the next 45 minutes or so is present an overview of the symbiotic relationship between <coughs> Pittsburgh and the war between 1861 and 1865. 
I say an overview because I'm really only able to touch on the most significant aspects of this relationship in the amount of time allotted. Now before proceeding, I'd like to make it perfectly clear that when I began to research this talk, I had little of any knowledge or appreciation for our area's role in what the southern gentry have called the late unpleasantness. <laughs> uh, but I was amazed to find out the magnitude of Pittsburgh's contribution to the Union's victory. My primary resource for the talk was Arthur B. Fox's excellent book entitled Pittsburgh During the American Civil War, 1860 to 1865. <coughs> While this is very hard to find anymore, it's an outstanding book, very uh, meticulously researched and documented, and will provide a wealth of information, a lot of detail for anybody in here who is interested in pursuing the subject further. But this is a real gem of a, of a book. <coughs> Pittsburgh's involvement in the war actually began before the war did. When in December of 1860, enraged Pittsburghers uh, prevented over 100 cannons that had been produced at the Fort Pitt foundry and stored at the Allegheny Arsenal from being shipped down the Ohio and Mississippi River to the U.S. Arsenal in New Orleans. They were, they were going to be shipped down there in response to Secretary of War John B. Floyd's orders. Now, Floyd was a suspected Southern sympathizer, and the suspicions pretty well bore out when he became the, uh, a, a general for the, for the Confederate side once the war began. But uh, Pittsburghers were afraid that were these guns allowed to be shipped south, that once the war, which seemed inevitable, inevitable, actually broke out, that they might be captured and turned against Union soldiers. And so they had made up their mind that they were either going to prevent the guns by being shipped south, by sinking the boats that were going to carry them, or they were going to die in the effort. They put a lot of political and letter-writing pressure on President Buchanan, who apparently was unaware of Floyd's orders. And uh, once he got word of this, he countermanded the order. And the guns went back into the arsenal for storage. Four of these cannons, by the way, were actually purchased from the arsenal in 1902 by George Westinghouse, <coughs> who presented them to the city. And one of them, actually two of them, now sit on the front lawn of the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall in Oakland. So if you want to see some actual artillery produced by the Fort Pitt Foundry, there's the place to go. Now once the war was actually declared, the city became a model of Northern commitment. After Lincoln's initial call for 75,000 volunteers on the 15th of April, 1861, and throughout the war, as repeated calls for men went out, Pittsburgh and Allegheny County certainly furnished their share. All told, the best agreed upon figure was almost 26,000 men from Allegheny County served in the Union Army or Navy during the four years of the war. Approximately 10% or 2,600 of them were probably drafted but regardless of how they came to be in the service, by the end of the war, nearly 4,000 of them were dead as a result of either battle or disease. Next time. Well, the government's next problem with all these volunteers pouring into service was how and where to train and equip the thousands of raw recruits they were getting. Here again, Pittsburgh played an important role. Eventually, nine military camps were established in the county for the purpose of assembling Western Pennsylvania recruits for training and deployment. This was more, by the way, than any other county in Pennsylvania. The first of these camps was established by the Citizens Committee of Defense, headed by George, Judge William Wilkins. 
named Camp Wilkins in honor of the judge, it was set up in the fairgrounds located in the present-day Strip District, south of Penn Avenue between 29th and 32nd Streets. Thousands of men lived and trained here until Camp Wilkins was closed in December of 1861. In May of that year, Camp Wright was established at Holton Station near the Allegheny River in present day Verona, Oakmont. She has some chairs in the other room. By the end of June, over 4,000 men were living here. Now, Camp Wright had nice, broad, grassy fields. It had a couple of orchards. It had some very freshwater springs, very beautiful freshwater springs. And it was remembered by the soldiers who were billeted there as probably the nicest campground they encountered throughout the entire war. Next slide. Camp Wright was closed in January of 1862. <coughs> now between July 61 and the fall of 64, four separate camps were established <coughs> in the present-day Oakland area. These four camps were spread out over approximately 150 <coughs> acres, currently occupied by the University of Pittsburgh and the commercial and residential district of present-day Oakland. Activity peaked in the autumn of 1862, when some 5,000 soldiers and over 1,000 horses were encamped there. The earliest of these four camps was Camp Scott, which was established as a cavalry camp at Linding Grove, a former public picnic area, on the 30th of July, 1861. <coughs> Linding Grove was in the general vicinity of what is today called South Oakland. By late August, the cavalry unit encamped there was ordered to Washington, and the camp was abandoned. About the same time that Camp Scott was being set up, a camp for infantry recruits was being set up less than half a mile from there, in the present-day Oakland Square neighborhood. Camp Fremont, as it was called, was the home to seven infantry companies that eventually became the nucleus of the 101st Pennsylvania Regiment. The occupation of Camp Fremont lasted only until October of 1861, when the soldiers there were sent east to Harrisburg and Camp Curtin. By 1862, a new camp, Camp Howe, <clears throat> Camp Howe, would incorporate the grounds of these two short-lived camps, along with other terrain in the Oakland area. Camp Howe, <clears throat> I think my throat's telling me something. Camp Howe, because of the length of time it existed and the sheer size of it, was probably the camp that most people remembered as the war faded into memory. The camp was established in the area bounded by Kraft Avenue, Bouquet Street, Fraser Street, and Forbes Avenue. Opening in the summer of 1862, it was approximately a quarter of a mile long on each side and at one point housed nearly 5,000 men. Camp Howe was used sporadically from its opening in June of 62 until its <coughs> final closure in July of 64. In fact, there's an, uh, an 1862 oil painting by Pittsburgh artist <coughs> Jasper Lawman hanging in the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, it really doesn't depict Camp Howe at the peak of its activity. In October of 62, the cavalrymen previously quartered at Camp Howe moved to the nearby area of the Van Voorhis race ground and camped there in what would come to be called Camp Montgomery. The race ground, also called Oakland Park, lay between Bouquet Street Pennsylvania Avenue, St. Pierre Street, which is now gone, and John Kerr Street, and comprised about 15 acres which are now occupied by the Pitt Student Union, the Law School, the Hillman Library, and Posvar Hall, among other buildings. <coughs> by the end of October, 
between 1,200 and 1,600 cavalrymen and over 1,000 horses were quartered there. In late November, most of the men were ordered to Hagerstown, Maryland, with the rest departing in December when the camp was closed. <clears throat> now, located near the Pennsylvania Railroad tracks at Braddock's Field, Camp Copeland opened on 1 August 1863. It was set on a well-drained ridge and had plenty of good water available. Unfortunately, permanent shelter wasn't built until January of 1864 as a result of a rather severe winter. And because of that, the soldiers who were encamped there really had to survive the winter uh, living in insufficient temporary quarters until the weather broke and they could erect permanent quarters. New recruits continued to pour in as others left to join their regiments. And at one point, the camp's population reached 6,000, which taxed its capabilities and led to problems associated with overcrowding. The name of the camp was camp, changed to Camp Reynolds <coughs> in April of 1864 in honor of General, Major General John Reynolds, a Pennsylvania general who was killed early on the first days fighting at Gettysburg. The camp was finally closed in May of 1865 after 22 months of continuous operation. Camp Swearinger, and that had to be a name come up with by the soldiers themselves, <laughs> had the briefest existence of any of the camps in the area. It was erected as a temporary encampment for the 15th Regiment Pennsylvania Infantry Militia, who had been raised during the Panic of June 1863. The camp was located in present-day Shadyside and was bounded by College Street on the east, Elmer Street on the north, Nagley Avenue on the west, and Elwood Street on the south. After Lee's defeat at Gettysburg and a subsequent retreat from Pennsylvania, the camp vanished. Another temporary encampment was organized in the Wilkinsburg area for Battery A, an artillery unit that was also raised as a result of the Panic of 63. And when I talk about the Panic of 63, this was the panic that ensued <clears throat> when locals got word of Lee's possible invasion of Pennsylvania and his, and his <coughs> campaign heading north. Named Camp Brooks after its commander, it disappeared in July, and its exact location is unknown. There were other temporary camps in and around the city, but most of these were so fleeting that they never even acquired a name. And like the better known camps, there's no evidence of them ever having existed that remains. Well, the next problem for the Union was equipping and, and arming the soldiers. Scores of Pittsburgh businesses and individuals profited from the war by selling a wide variety of goods and services <coughs> to the Army, either via government contracts or to individual soldiers and, sa soldiers and civilians who lived or transited the area. Although some of the material produced in Pittsburgh went to equip units assembled at the various camps in the area, most of it went to federal posts and installations outside the local area in both the eastern and western theaters. Now, if you stop for a moment and think about all of the things that an army requires, it's really quite overwhelming. I mean, everything from clothing, tents, equipment, tools, medicine, uh, food, arms, ammunition, wagons, uh, caissons, and the horses and mules required to pull those things had to be provided on, a, on an ongoing basis. And Pittsburgh had an awful lot of what the Union needed. And this doesn't even take <coughs> into account all of the personal items that the soldiers might have wanted or needed. Things like sewing kits or sewing uh, instruments, 
newspapers, tobacco, alcohol, specialty food items, and the like. While most of the personal items for the soldiers were supplied by sutlers that seemed to appear wherever more than 10 or 20 soldiers congregated, most of the other necessities were supplied from businesses contracted through the government. And as I said before, Pittsburgh had an awful lot of what the Army needed. Next slide. Food, as the old saying goes, a stomach, a stomach marches on its army. <laughs> An army marches on its stomach. And so food was a critical element. Uh, Food was provided by 43, 43 wholesale and retail grocers who had established themselves in the area and were operating by 1862. The wholesalers were mainly concentrated downtown on Liberty Street, while the retailers were mostly on Federal Street, Diamond Street, and Penn Avenue. Besides whole, wholesalers and retailers, uh, watching their business boom, local eating establishments also profited by feeding uh, soldiers and civilians that either lived here permanently or transited the area during the four years of the war. Next. <coughs> local merchants also provided shelter. 32 area hotels and innumerable boarding houses provided temporary lodging for soldiers passing through the city, and in many cases, permanent quarters for officers who found themselves stationed here for their tour of duty. One of the most famous hotels in Pittsburgh, in fact, Pittsburgh's only four-star hotel, was the Monongahela House, which was situated at the corner of Smithfield and Water Streets. Both General Grant and President Lincoln stayed at the Monongahela House at one time. And here you can see a drawing of the Monongahela House as it appeared around 1870. Pretty impressive hotel. No valet parking. <laughs> Next. To help clothe the thousands of new recruits pouring in, the government contracted with at least 21 companies or individuals in Pittsburgh to turn out uniform items. In the one year period from June 61 to June 62, you can see the number of uniform uh, items that were sewn in Pittsburgh. And these numbers only increased as the war went on. Besides the clothing, uh, cap and cartridge boxes, belts, holsters, saddles, and other tack were being turned out by local leather workers and thousands of canteens and cups, belt buckles, bayonets, swords, and harness hardware were being produced by local tinsmiths and uh, metal workers. There were even three drum making enterprises in the city. <coughs> and near the dam number two on the Monongahela, about 10 miles east of the city, the firm of George Miller reportedly had a sawmill that turned out two million gun stocks for the government from 1861 to 1865. Yeah. Local chemists, what today we call pharmacists, made and sold medicinal cures to individual soldiers as well as the army. The only documented supplier was a Dr. David Hostetter, who made a fortune selling carloads of his medicinal bitters to both the army and individual soldiers as a cure for diarrhea. Uh, the fact that his medicinal bitters were 47% alcohol leads me to believe that probably a lot of those individual sales weren't necessarily used for medicinal purposes. But who knows? Quinine was considered the wonder drug of the war and was used extensively when available to treat and prevent malaria was also used to treat syphilis, rheumatism, neuralgia, diarrhea, and fevers, among other things. Kind of a catch-all 
uh, medicine. Opium and morphine were both used as painkillers. Morphine was readily available in Pittsburgh because it was produced in Pittsburgh during the war. And because of its ready availability and widespread use and treatment, many Civil War veterans became addicted to it. There was also a continuing need for animals throughout the war, which Pittsburgh helped to meet. For example, Army records show that between June of 61 and September of 62, 1,120 horses and 450 mules were purchased in the Pittsburgh area. This is actually iron, but I thought I'd put it in Pittsburgh ease. <laughs> this is someone who came from living 20 years in Alabama. Like I have any room at all. Okay. If they do decide to be secede, I suggest we let them go. <laughs> Industries like iron, steel, and oil all boomed by producing things like iron rail for the Union's vast railroad system. Steel plating, iron plating for the iron plant, uh, metal to be turned into nails, and metal used in produce, for producing guns and ammo at either the Fort Pitt foundry or the Allegheny Arsenal. During the war, Pittsburgh boasted 26 rolling mills that employed over 3,000 men. There were also 33 foundries and machine shops with 1,600 other employees, as well as 90 puddling furnaces, 130 heating furnaces, 260 mill machines, eight boiler yards, and 23 glass houses. I'm not sure what all of these things do, but they're all associated with the iron and steel industry primarily. Some of the biggest mills were the Clinton Iron Works, which produced 8 to 10 tons of hoop iron for oil barrels each day and some 1,500 kegs of nails each week. And Jones and Laughlin, a very familiar name, who finished their extensive expansion on the Southside facilities in 1861, just in time to meet the unprecedented command that the war produced. Rolling mills included the A.M. Byers Company, which opened in 1863 with an annual capacity of 25,000 tons of iron. The Republican Iron Works opened two new mills in 1863 that had a total of 32,000 ton annual capacity. And the Carnegie Brothers, while already in business in the Millvale section of Pittsburgh prior to the war, opened a huge mill in Bayardstown in 1864 with a 65,000 ton annual capacity. Next. <coughs> all in all, by the way, the iron industry grew 65% in the four years of the war. And in the last year of the war alone, six new large mills were established in Pittsburgh. So this kicked off the uh, iron and steel industry, it really gave a boost to it for the local area. Meanwhile, the growth in the steel industry was nearly as great as it was in the iron industry. Take one example, the firm of Hussey Wells and Company at 17th Street and Penn Avenue, originally founded in 1860, initially produced two tons of steel for edged tools a day. By 1864, it had expanded its output to 20 tons of steel a day, which made it the largest steel producer in the country at that time. Coal was needed for the foundries and for transportation, and roughly 5.5 million tons of it were mined in the area during the war, which was approximately half a million tons more than in any other four-year period prior to the war. So again, the coal industry got a big boost as a result of the war. Fire brick production, which was needed to replace the, light, 
the linings of iron furnaces due to their increased use also increased. <coughs> and if you remember, in 1859, oil was discovered in a little town north of Pittsburgh, and oil refining in the city employed about 700 men at that time. <clears throat> Next slide. Of course, with the increased demand came an increase in price, and several <coughs> factors led to this increase in price. Mainly due to inflation, uh, the greenback <coughs> was kind of being devalued against gold during the war, and the cost of labor and material. Labor costs, the rise in labor costs, mainly resulted from a manpower shortage that occurred, either because of many men joining the army, as well as a lot of local laborers going north to Oil City, where reportedly they were making $50 a day drilling and transporting this new fuel. And so in order to keep local labor in the city, Local businesses and manufacturers had to raise labor costs because they had to raise wages. To give you an example, one example of the rise in prices, the cost of a ton of pig iron went from $18.18 to $33.82 in four years. That was an 86% increase. And while that seems like a lot, the things that went into producing that ton of pig iron rose even more. <clears throat> the cost of coal went up 197%. Iron ore was 92% higher. Limestone, 144%. And labor cost, 131% higher in the same period. Next. <clears throat> now, because this wasn't a war that was just fought on land, Local shipbuilding expanded to produce both seagoing and river-based monitors and gunboats. In fact, over, 100, over 750 boats of various types were built in area shipyards during the four years of the war. When I started this, I never even knew that there was a shipyard in Pittsburgh. So this was really an eye-opener to me. Pittsburgh railroads also flourished during the war as a result of the increased transportation requirements. The Pennsylvania Railroad opened its corridor in Pittsburgh in 1852 along Liberty <coughs> Avenue, which became the main route of rail transportation out of and east of Pittsburgh uh, <coughs> during the 1860s. Besides carrying thousands of soldiers out of local camps to the east, the railroad also transported almost all of the ordnance produced at the Fort Pitt Foundry in the Allegheny Arsenal. While it's difficult to determine exactly how much of the increased transportation can be attributed purely to the military, the Pennsylvania Railroad alone experienced approximately a 100% increase in tonnage shipped in the four years of the war. Okay, while much of what I've covered so far may be unfamiliar to some of you, what I'm going to talk about next probably all of you have heard about in some way. Uh, most recently, maybe through a series that the uh, Post-Gazette did a couple months ago. Next slide. And that topic is the Allegheny Arsenal. The Allegheny Arsenal is located in present-day Lawrenceville, and it worked at its greatest capacity ever during the four <coughs> years of the Civil War. During this time, it served as a storage, inspection, and repair facility for weapons, but it didn't actually produce any weapons itself. It did, however, produce tens of millions of cartridges for many of the pistols, carbines, muskets, and rifles used by the Army. Additionally, ammunition for over a dozen different types of field and siege cannons were assembled, packed, stored, and shipped from the arsenal. 
But if people know anything at all about the arsenal, it's probably about the tragedy that occurred there on 17 September 1862. On that day, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, three separate explosions at the arsenal killed 78 workers, most of them young females, uh, who worked in the arsenal. One of the reasons was because of their small hands, the small fingers. It was easy for them to fill cartridges and so on. Most of the victims are actually buried in the Allegheny Cemetery. And while this tragedy was a major event in the Pittsburgh area, country-wise it got very little coverage. Why? Because it occurred on the 17th of September, 1862, the same date as the Battle of Antietam, in which 23,000 casualties were taken. The Allegheny Arsenal, however, does remain as the only evidence of a Civil War site in Pittsburgh. Although it hasn't been kept under great repair, uh, and currently <coughs> one of the few remaining buildings, a powder house, is currently being used as public uh, restrooms. Mm -hmm. so. <clears throat> Here you can see a uh, photograph of one entry to the arsenal. I'm not sure if this is the Butler Street entry or not. I should know that, but I don't. I think it is. Okay, next. Although the arsenal didn't produce any of the weapons used in the Civil War, another important establishment in Pittsburgh did, and that was the Fort Pitt Foundry, also known as the Fort Pitt Works. Founded by a Scotsman, Joseph McClurg, in 1804, it was originally located at 5th and Smithfield Streets downtown, across from the Kaufman's department store. It was relocated to the Strip District near the Allegheny River, close to the current uh, location of the Heinz History Center. In 1858, it burned to the ground, but was rebuilt and expanded. And once the war broke out, it underwent further expansion, adding eight furnaces capable of melting up to 340 tons of metal total. Once it was in full production, it took part in every phase of production, every aspect of it. It had lathes for turning the guns, cranes for lifting them, and dozens of steam engines used for boring, machining, etc. It had a workforce of 280 men with a payroll of $5,000 a week. Between, oh, uh, this is a, uh, let's see if this one works. Does it return to uh, This is a drawing of, of the uh, foundry along the south bank of the Allegheny River at its location after it moved from downtown. And these are drawings illustrating some of the steps in the process of producing some of the very large artillery pieces that the foundry turned out. <coughs> Between January 1861 and December 1866, the foundry produced 2,281 pieces of artillery, ranging everywhere from 4-inch rifled guns to 15-inch Rodman guns. But it really gained its greatest fame for the six enormous guns that it produced between 1864 and 1869, these six 20-inch it also produced 20,000 rounds of shot and shell by March of 62 and continued that <coughs> level of production throughout the war. In fact, the Fort Pitt Foundry produced 60% of all the Union artillery that was produced under government contract during the war. So this was a, a significant industry here in Pittsburgh. 
this is uh, the only known photograph of one of these six 20-inch Dahlgren Rodman guns turned out by the foundry. And you can see, comparing them to the size of the men standing beside them, these things were enormous. They weighed over 100,000 pounds and fired cannonballs that weighed 1,000 pounds or so each. So they were enormous guns. Where were they deployed? Uh, these were normally deployed. They never, they were deployed, and normally they would be deployed in sea, uh, seaside fortresses to protect the sea coast because they were too big to put on ships, really. It took something like two and a half minutes to change the sighting on these things. They were so heavy. <coughs> well, once these guns were produced, the next step was to test them, because each of them had to be fired a couple hundred times before they were turned over <coughs> to the Army, having been deemed safe. <coughs> and initially, Mount Washington served as a test site. Uh, but this probably ended early in the 1800s as the population on the south side of the Monongahela increased. And the uh, residents there tended to frown upon their neighborhood being used as an artillery test site. You know, but in July of 1861, the first permanent test site was established near Toronto. It was known as Canberra, or Bang, Bang Town on the Allegheny, which, considering its function, was a fairly appropriate name. Six months later, in December of 61, the second test area opened, half a mile east of present-day Pitcairn in southeast Allegheny County. It was known as the Walls Station. <coughs> and in both these test areas, the cannons were tested as they were before by firing uh, cannonballs into the side of a hill, which allowed the cannonballs to be recovered and reused for testing. Actually, there is a cannonball, one that weighs 1,080 pounds, that was actually tested at the Wall Station Proving Ground, currently on display in a park at Trafford. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here you can uh, see a picture of this thing. It's enormous. This, by the way, is uh, Arthur Fox, the author of this book I recommend to you, standing beside this enormous cannonball. Next. Okay. Besides the various encampments that I talked about earlier in the lecture, uh, there were actually Civil War fortifications here in Pittsburgh. Quite a few of them, as it turns out. In June of 1861, the Army engineers did a survey of the city and pronounced Pittsburgh's location the strongest in the country. However, because of its uh, position as a both rail and river transportation <coughs> center, and the fact that the arsenal and the foundry were both located here, Pittsburgh was considered as a possible strategic target in the event of a Confederate invasion. And because of that, uh, well, I don't know. in June of 63, nothing was done prior to this, but in June of 63, when word of Lee's northward movement with the possible goal of invading Pennsylvania reached Pittsburgh, panic ensued. And the Department of the <coughs> Army actually established a Department of the Monongahela with headquarters here in Pittsburgh. And joining with local businesses, they undertook the largest undertaking that the city did in response <coughs> to the war in the event of an attack, to, in other words, to counter a possible attack. Next. Oh, no, never mind. 
talking to myself here. <laughs> In the three-week period between mid-June and early July, a 12-mile ring of earthen redoubts, battery sites, and powder magazines, along with one full-fledged fort, were built to defend the city, mainly using civilian labor. <coughs> Miles of entrenchments were built to connect many of the sites, with civilian volunteers and the 15th Pennsylvania Volunteer Militia expected to man these sites in the event of an attack. The fortifications consisted entirely of earthworks built into a plan of strongholds and entrenchments. A series of independent redoubts or temporary strongholds constituted the basic element of construction. Most of these redoubts were anywhere from 65 to 90 yards in diameter, although at least one of them was square. And these were supported with batteries, troop trenches, and moats. Now the amount of labor that went into this massive construction was enormous. While there's no uh, exact record of the number of laborers involved, local newspaper articles <coughs> state that a minimum of 4,500 to 5,000 up to a maximum of about 11,000 men worked on these fortifications every day. And most of these men were pulled from local factories and businesses, and their labor was expected to be reimbursed to the companies they came from by the government. But that's another story. Uh, it wasn't resolved until the turn of the century. Ultimately, 37 sites surrounded the city. And the most impressive of these was Fort Black, which also went by the name of Fort Chess, Fort Lytle, and Fort Squirrel Hill. Fort Squirrel Hill was located on Lytle's farm near present-day Bigelow <coughs> Boulevard between Parade and Shield Streets. And it guarded the Monongahela River Terrace. It became a local landmark with some of its ruins standing into the 20th century. Unfortunately, no remains of any of these sites remain today. On the other hand, fortunate, fortunately, none of them were ever really needed. Okay. Here you can see a, a map that was done in July of 63 it shows the location of most of these 3,700 sites. I superimposed these little flashes on them to make them stand out. But right here is uh, Fort Black or Fort Squirrel Hill. You can see they ring the entire city pretty well. So we've seen that Pittsburgh produced a lot of men and material that caused death and destruction during the Civil War. But the city had a softer side also. Although Pittsburgh never suffered the fate of having thousands of wounded and dead soldiers left in their residences and front and back yards, as for example the citizens of Gettysburg did following the battle, Pittsburgh nevertheless uh, treated many wounded and sick soldiers throughout the four years of the war. Four Pittsburgh hospitals and the soldiers' home all contributed to servicing, providing medical service for Union soldiers. Western Pennsylvania Hospital became the first veterans' hospital in Pittsburgh. Additionally, the U.S. Marine Hospital in the Woods Run area and the Pittsburgh Infirmary and Mercy Hospital, both located in the Lower Hill District, all cared for sick and wounded troops during the war. At times, the population being cared for by these hospitals reached 1,500, with numbers increasing following a major battle. And this is a drawing of West Penn 
uh, located in Polish Hill uh, about 1880. Next. Uh, yes, I think you did. Following the Battle of Shiloh in Tennessee, April 6th and 7th, 1862, Pittsburgh sent two river steamers down the Ohio and up to Tennessee to bring back wounded northern soldiers to facilities located in the north. Uh, these two steamers were staffed with medical teams, and on the way back, they dropped off 440 soldiers at various points along the river. But they arrived in Pittsburgh with 48 sick and wounded soldiers who were taken to the Marine Hospital at Woods Run and treated. Treatment, by the way, in Pittsburgh was provided by both civilian and military doctors and nurses. Not military nurses because they didn't have a formal nurse corps. Uh, all of the nurses were actually civilians. Now, the citizens of Pittsburgh also supported the Union cause throughout the war by donating and collecting food, <coughs> bedding, clothing, medical supplies, and money to be sent to various <coughs> Union installations and hospitals. Most of this was done through the Subsistence Committee, which was a branch of the Committee of Public Safety, which started operations in July of 1861. It was estimated that 460,000 troops were fed by the subsistence committee from July 61 to July of 65. A lot of them just handed a ham sandwich and a cup of coffee as they passed through the city on a train, okay, heading east or west. The subsistence committee also ran the soldier's home. The soldier's home was a four-story building located at 347 Liberty Street downtown. It opened in January 63. And what this home away from home did was offered medical care and free food and lodging for soldiers that passed through the city. Uh, money to run this came from local businesses, churches, and individuals in the area. Here you can see a poster that would be posted around town inviting soldiers that arrived in the city to come to the soldiers' home and have their wounds dressed and get a good meal and a place to stay while they were here. Another thing that subsistence committees throughout the country did was to organize sanitary fairs to raise money for supplies and medicines for the army hospitals and camps. Pittsburgh held its own from June 1st to June 18th, 1864. And they set it up in the area of present-day Allegheny City and what was then the city of Allegheny on the North Shore. Thousands of people attended this thing, and the $360,000 that was raised was more on a per capita basis than was raised at any other sanitary fair in the country during the war. Some of the money raised went to establish a home for Western Pennsylvania veterans after the war. So even as far back as the Civil War, Pittsburgh and Allegheny County took care of its soldiers. This is a, uh, a photograph of of the bazaar aspect. The bazaar was one of six buildings that were set up for this fair in Allegheny City. And the bazaar was where a lot of uh, donated goods were sold uh, to fairgoers.
final aspect of the war involving Pittsburgh that I want to briefly touch on tonight deals with POWs. It might surprise a lot of you to know that thousands of Southern POWs passed through the city during the war and that Confederate soldiers are actually buried in local cemeteries. One of the early instances involved two wounded POWs that came back on those hospital ships that had gone down to the Battle of Shiloh. They were treated along with the Union soldiers at that Marine hospital in the Woods Run area before being sent off to a prison camp. Confederate POWs passed through the city from both east and west, depending on where they were captured and where they were going to be uh, imprisoned. Most of the movement involved transferring to and from trains, different railroad trains that came together in Pittsburgh. But 111 POWs were actually held here in Pittsburgh from the summer of 1863 to early spring 1864. They were incarcerated in the old Western Penitentiary, the site of the current National Aviary. Apparently, they were qu treated quite well by the locals, especially the ladies, because they were transferred to other prisons in March of 64, largely due to the unrest created among the jealous men of the Pittsburgh garrison. <laughs> <laughs> they felt that these Confederate POWs were getting a lot more attention than they were. But in 1831, uh, their stay here was commemorated by a bronze plaque erected by the now defunct Pittsburgh chapter of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And that plaque now shares a cage with the rare Siberian red crown cranes over at the National Aviary. <laughs> There are also nine known Confederate soldiers buried in Allegheny Cemetery in Lawrenceville. And if you'd like to see them, you can go to the Soldiers Memorial Plot, Section 63, 33, 33. thank you. And uh, it's easy to distinguish their gravestones because they're pointed like this as opposed to being rounded. Supposedly, that was kind of retribution in case anyone wanted to sit on them. <laughs> okay, this in fact is a drawing of Western Penitentiary at the time where the prisoners were housed. Next. And here is a photo of uh, five of the POWs. These, I think 109 of the 111 prisoners were actually officers. And as you can see from this picture, they don't seem to be suffering too badly. <laughs> yeah. Most of these, by the way, were cavalrymen also. They were captured from uh, some of the cavalry raids that were being conducted in Ohio and Kentucky and brought here. Next. Oh, okay. Well, I hope that this uh, brief introduction to the role of Pittsburgh in the Civil War has opened your eyes a little bit to the importance of our city to the Union cause. And I hope that it's also shown you, in a symbiotic relationship kind of way, some of the impact that the war had on the growth and prosperity of our city. As I said at the beginning, for anybody that wants to get a lot more detail on any aspect of what I've talked about, this is an excellent starting point. There's also an awful lot of material in local libraries, particularly the main library and the one down in Carnegie, which actually has a Civil War room dedicated entirely to the Civil War. There's also information online. And there are various people around the city that have an overwhelming <coughs> store of knowledge about various aspects of the war. Uh, I can think of one, a man by the name of Alan Besser, who wrote a very nice article on the Allegheny Arsenal. Uh, Olive Verbit here has done talks about the Allegheny Arsenal down at the uh, Heinz History Center. 
So there are, there's lots of information out there, lots of resources that you can draw on, again, if you want to learn more about any particular aspect. And uh, with that, I'll open it up to some questions. Amazingly, a lot of people would have thought that Pittsburgh was 100% Union. No. There were numerous uh, Southern sympathizers in the city. And uh, if it became known, a lot of them weren't treated very well. They weren't necessarily civically abused, but, uh, uh, you know, they were just looked at as sort of askance. In fact, some were actually driven out of town, now that, now that I recall. Some of them were actually driven out of town if they made their southern sympathies too obvious. Okay. Yes? Excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, in, in our book on the history of East Liberty, we have a couple of photos of the redoubt that was built in East Liberty in 1863, when the uh, uh, threat of Lee's invasion came to be known. We, we have the uh, gun emplacements and the uh, cannon emplacements. They're there today. Well, they are there today. Yes, they've been preserved. Ah, OK. Uh, I was under the impression nicely, there was. Nicely hidden location in East Liberty. Okay. And if we ever get our act together, we can start running tours <coughs> to that location. Sounds great. Right. I was going to say, is your name Al Mann? That's right. Uh, we stayed at your house when we came here to decide to move back. <laughs> <laughs> With uh, Evergreen. Yeah. Yeah, you were just finishing up your book at that time. Yeah. I had copies. <laughs> <laughs> I think I told you then I chose to wait for the movie, but... <laughs> yes? Uh, you were a docent in Alabama. I was. Yeah. What, what is the approach that you took there? <laughs> the uh, war? Well, they obviously knew I wasn't from Alabama because of the way that I spoke. I tried, like Fox News, to present a fair and balanced... Uh, no, I did. Uh, a fair and balanced view of the war. I tried not to lean one way or the other. Uh, because really, when you think about it, when you're talking about the soldiers themselves, both sides, you know, the, the level of valor and gallantry that was exhibited by both sides is, is almost unspeakable. And, and so, despite the fact that they were trying to separate from the country, I think their, their uh, bravery and, and the sacrifice that they made has to be respected and presented in a respectful way. And I tried to do that. Too. Most of my talks down there were uh, with school kids, actually. Uh, I ended up speaking mainly to third and fourth graders. Uh, and occasionally I'd forget my, my pepper spray, which made it a long day. Uh, <laughs> We actually had a, a bunch of facsimile equipment, so I'd get kids up there and dress them up in it. I always made them wear the Confederate uniform. They didn't want their father beating them or something when they got home. Uh, I had a lot of fun with it, really. That's good. Yes? Can you talk about some of the attitudes in and around Western Pennsylvania towards slavery, maybe at the beginning of the war or the end of the war? Uh, that isn't, uh, nothing about that in here, but that's fine. I know it's something about it from other sources. Uh, Western Pennsylvania, of course, didn't have slaves at the time. And there were a lot of uh, abolitionists living in the North. And of course, that meant there were probably some living in Western Pennsylvania. 
It wouldn't surprise me, though, if there were also uh, a number of copperheads in the area that were pro-Southern and, by extent, perhaps pro-slavery, since that was the main issue between the two sides during the war. Uh, I don't recall reading anything about any large contingent of pro-slavery citizens in the area, but that may be because I haven't seen it yet, not because there wasn't one. We were a major stop along the Underground Railroad. Right. <laughs> 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 Up so, in the hill district, down to the river, down to the point. Um, there's a Haas and Sailor right on the boulevard across from the cemetery. That was a, uh, At, uh, a was house. stop. Yeah, okay. Rumor has it there's a tunnel underneath <coughs> from Gouda Cemetery up to the hillside. Okay. Uh, trying to find that tunnel. But uh, yeah, it's been a major stop. So that would lead me to believe that probably uh, slavery sentiment was pretty low for what existed was probably pretty subdued <coughs> during the during the war. I thought I read somewhere that in school too, maybe Alameda, there was also a house that um, it also served as a yeah. way stop on the underground railroad. <coughs> yeah, the Murdoch, the Murdoch family. Yeah, right at, uh, Darling, Charles Avery. Was it Charles Avery? Charles Avery. Also, Jane Swisshelm mm -hmm. was a noted abolitionist and a firebrand writer, and that she was close by. Yes, are there any notable commanders, Union commanders in the, from this area, you know, like Strong Vincent in uh, Erie? And right. Uh, there were several, I wouldn't say noted, because I had never heard of them before I started reading <laughs> this book, but he mentions, Mr. Fox mentions several uh, generals that were either commanders of various establishments in the area who were reassigned here as a result of being wounded or something like that, or left here and went back to the actual fighting. Uh, none of them, none of the names I saw were any that I've ever recognized. They certainly aren't on this time. <laughs> uh, I don't know. All right, really, I don't know any more than that. Yes, uh, General Negley, uh, James Negley, I believe was his name, was a, a native of Highland Park, and he became well known for his exploits in the South, in the, the western uh, district of, of field of the uh, Civil War. He. He was cited for as an infantry his, commander, yes, or as a his yeah. bravery and a okay. he, was, he was highly regarded. We have a little piece on him. Right now. <laughs> okay. What's his first name? Uh, James. 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 Nagley. Nagley. James. Nagley. 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 I looked and up. Of course, uh, Nagley's name remains a prominent one here in the <coughs> stand. Ah, well, there are two Alexander Hayes. <coughs> Yeah, and I'm not sure if he was the one that was the really good one or the other one that had the same name and didn't get so well to get his Gettysburg. Uh, but yeah, if it's the good one, then he would certainly be one of them. Is point. he in Allegheny Cemetery? Yes. Is He's that the one that Grant yes. came to visit? Yes. Uh, then he was the good yes. one. He was the good one. Yeah. And they had the camp from the arsenal buried upside down around his grave. Okay. Before the war, 1856, February 1856, the Republican Party <coughs> found a founding meeting here in Old Lafayette Hall. Oh, uh, where's Old Lafayette Hall? Well, it's not here anymore. Oh, okay. It's Fourth and Wood. Fourth and Wood? Oh, okay. I have never heard of sanitary fears before. Oh, yeah. I mean, it sounds yeah. so charming. I can't, how did they get all those people to go? The sanitary commission was everywhere. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure why they called them sanitary fairs unless it had to do with the uh, 
things that they bought and then sent to the encampments and the hospitals, things like medicine and bandages and things like that. Surgical. Being Surgical. except on the north side in, in near the aviary a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. sanitary fair, right. reenactment. Okay. Probably before I got here. Yes? From how far away were the men who were in the camps within Pittsburgh? Uh, most of most of the men that that uh, that were encamped here in Pittsburgh came from western Pennsylvania, very eastern parts of Ohio, uh, northern West Virginia after 1863, but before that from northwestern Virginia. Uh, so it was mainly just what we probably would consider the Pittsburgh SMSA now. Or the metropolitan area, yeah. David, um, we had a, a Medal of Honor winner, um, for, I'm sorry, you didn't say winner, a Medal of Honor awardee, um, Colonel James Schoonmaker, who's buried in Homewood Cemetery. Um, I don't remember which battle he received it for his bravery, but um, um, he was a Squirrel Hill person. And also, uh, someone, I forget who, the gentleman brought in a my great 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 grandfather uh, served in Pennsylvania Volunteers uh, Regiment 61, Company D, from July 1963 through uh, 65 when he was discharged. And I brought along his uh, saber and some documentation and some photos. So if you'd like to have a look. <coughs> My great, great, great grandfather, John Gottlieb Lieb, served in the Pennsylvania Volunteers in the 61st Regiment, Company D, from July of 1963 uh, to 1865 when he was mustered out. Uh, these are his uh, belongings, his photograph, his wife. And documentation from the state archives, and the federal records. And this is his Ames heavy cavalry saber. Which, uh, I can't back up far enough to see it. Maryland, Virginia, in the uh, in the time period from approximately uh, December of 1960, 1863, just after Gettysburg, till uh, mid 1865. It's uh, of course been in our family since then. There's a history of the regiment and company that uh, I took a few excerpts from, the History of Pennsylvania Volunteers, uh, 1861 to 5, by uh, Samuel P. Bates, which is a multi volume comprehensive uh, set. It's all available online. Would you like to say your name? My name is Gregory Carter, and I hope you folks enjoyed this. Good day.